Hello again, everyone, and welcome to this edition of Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret. We're in the book of Hebrews, going verse by verse through the book of Hebrews as we go through the entire New Testament this series. Now, normally I go through the whole Bible, which is what I've been doing for 33 years. But this time, just the New Testament. I wanted to focus on the New Testament. So get your Bible, open it up to Hebrews chapter 12, and we will begin our study in verse number 3. Study the whole Bible with me. As I mentioned, I've been teaching it for 33 years. It's all archived. It's all saved at thebibleversebyverse.com. You can go through the whole Bible three times, almost four, using my audio Bible messages. It is as simple as clicking and listening right there at thebibleversebyverse.com. And Father, we pray that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. I think I'll go back and begin reading in Hebrews 12, verse 1. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. And we looked in depth, spent a lot of time on these two verses last time. Just something else stood out to me here, though, in verse 2 that I do want to talk about briefly, talking about Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despised the shame. There was no joy in that cross. He was paying for the curse of our sin. It was horrible. It was a nightmare beyond our imaginations. It was so bad for him, not just physically, but spiritually, as he bore our sins. But he endured it because he looked beyond the cross to the results of the cross, which would be the salvation of millions of souls who would repent and receive him as Lord and Savior. It was a huge price to pay for our sins. But Jesus thought that it was worth it. He flipped the bill for us so that we wouldn't have to go to hell. And he looked forward to being with us in heaven, creating a new earth where we could all be there together, all of us who have received him. He looked forward to the good times ahead. The good times must be great. You know that for Christians? They must be something else. Or he never would have went through the hell that he went through to purchase them for us. Verse 3, For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. In other words, bad things may be happening in your life, and bad people may be doing terrible things to you, you may be experiencing unfair treatment from others. Maybe someone you trusted has betrayed your trust. That's a tough pill to swallow. You maybe thought you could trust that person forever. And yet they proved to be unfaithful. Maybe worse. Whatever the case, 
Understand this. Jesus experienced all those things to an infinite degree, more than you and I could ever possibly experience them. Jesus experienced all those terrible things because God allowed them to happen. Jesus experienced unimaginable cruelty and terrible suffering in order to, in order to accomplish a greater good for us. When we are tempted to feel sorry for ourselves because of the bad things in our life, God is telling us to remember that Jesus was completely sinless, completely innocent, and therefore all of his sufferings were uncalled for to an infinite degree. And all mistreatment of him was uncalled for to an infinite degree as well. Verse 5. And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto sons. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, Stop right there for a second. Whenever trouble comes into your life, whatever trouble may come into your life, whatever trials come into your life, whatever the human or natural source of those bad things may be, make sure you see them for what they are. And that would be the discipline of God. And do not take them lightly. In other words, do not despise them. Do not despise the trouble you are facing. Because I don't care what the human source is. I don't care what the demonic source may be. God has allowed it. It is his divine discipline. Now, some of you may find that hard to believe. Because the human source is so cruel. But I can tell you that what you are experiencing is nothing compared to the seriousness of the cruelty that Jesus experienced. Because he was infinitely sinless, infinitely holy, the Son of God, the Creator, the Sustainer, the Life Giver. And he was treated unimaginably cruel by wicked sinners. And it was the will of God. So when you suffer the chastisement of God, remember Jesus who suffered at the hands of sinners so unfairly, totally unfairly, infinitely unfairly, to bring about a greater good for us. And God wants to accomplish a greater good in you through whatever sufferings he allows into your life. I know that doesn't set well with 21st century modern evangelicalism and certainly doesn't set well with word of faith people, but it's the absolute truth. Do not despise the trouble you are facing. It is God's discipline. Now, let me suggest to you a couple of ways in which Christians despise God's discipline. Because God says, don't despise it. So you better know what to avoid, right? So that you don't do that. Well, number one, Christians can despise God's discipline by complaining or becoming bitter over their problems. Did you know that complaining is a sin? Did you know that bitterness is a sin? And as you know, I hope, sin pulls us away from God, which is the exact opposite of what God wants to accomplish through his discipline. Complaining and bitterness are sins which pull us away from God, whereas 
fervently seeking him in times of trouble, accomplishes the spiritual good that he has in mind. So Christians despise God's discipline by complaining or becoming bitter over their troubles. Christians can also despise God's discipline by seeing whatever trouble that has come into their life as simply being some kind of unjust act perpetrated by a bad person. If that's all you see, you are despising God's discipline. You are missing the point, and you are missing reality. And I did touch on this earlier, but I want to talk about it again because this one is so prevalent. Christians say, oh, this bad person is doing these bad things. They shouldn't be doing these bad things. This can't be the discipline of God because this person is just too evil. That's what it's about. This person is too evil. They're doing too many bad things to me. This isn't about God's discipline. This is about this bad person. No. Yeah, it's a bad person doing bad things to you. But God allowed it, just like he allowed the bad people who did the bad things to Jesus to do it. You say, they shouldn't be doing these bad things to me. Well, maybe they shouldn't be doing those bad things to you. But that's really not the issue as far as you are concerned. It isn't. It is true that bad people do bad things that they shouldn't do. However, that shouldn't be our main focus when we are in the midst of all that bad. Our main focus is God's children. Our main focus as Christians should be to accept whatever bad happens to us as the Father's discipline. Listen, God's either in control or he isn't. And if he's not, that means you are, or I am, or somebody else is, or Satan is, and that's not true. Because the Bible says no purpose or plan of God can be thwarted. God works all things after the counsel of his own will. So don't tell me that God has not allowed it. Don't tell me that God is not in control. Don't tell me that it's not his discipline because the Bible says that it is. Our main focus is God's children as Christians should be accept, it should be to accept whatever bad happens to us as the Father's discipline. That doesn't mean we can't pray for a change. That doesn't mean we can't work for a change. But if it is there, it is there. And for as long as it's there, receive it as God's discipline. So again, do not despise God's discipline by reacting to it the wrong way, because that will short circuit for sure what Almighty God wants to accomplish, and all the suffering will be for nothing. Verse 5 And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto sons. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. God says, do not faint. In other words, what God is saying is, don't become discouraged when you are reproved by your father through the bad times that he allows into your life. Again, just forget the human source. It doesn't matter. Don't get discouraged. Don't faint. Some Christians get discouraged over hard times, and in the process, they don't profit from God's discipline. When trouble hits, they may buy something. Let's go to the mall. Let's go to the department store. Let's see what they have at, at the mail order place. When trouble hits, they might buy something that they don't need, they shop to forget. Sometimes they take pills. Sometimes they get drunk to cover the pressure. And there are others whom I have known who lock themselves in their room and they sleep for sorrow. Sometimes they don't come out of bed for days. I suppose just go to the bathroom, <laughs> but that's it. 
Some just walk around feeling sorry for themselves. It doesn't matter. It's all the same thing. It's all ignoring the discipline of their Father in heaven, which is the real issue. And be aware of this. God says, faint not when you are disciplined. Be aware of this. Becoming faint-hearted or discouraged can happen before we even know it. It can slip in the back door of our soul without us even noticing it. But when we do notice it, when we do recognize it, wake up and don't nurse it. Do not nurse the discouragement. When bad times hit, we as Christians can respond in one of two ways. You can draw closer to God through prayer, fasting, and the Word of God, in which case God will respond to them by providing comfort and instruction in the midst of that pain, taking you to a new level of holiness, a new level of, level of commitment to Him, or Christians can respond incorrectly by complaining, becoming stubborn, indifferent, bitter, discouraged. That's, that's, it's on you, totally. It's on me, totally up to us. But God tells us, don't despise my discipline and don't faint. Six, for whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. Stop right there for a second. Some Christians think, honestly, and it's tempting to think this way, but it's not true. Some Christians think that the trouble they are experiencing in their life is a result of God being angry at them. But we've already seen that that's not true. Some Christians think that the trouble they are experiencing means that God doesn't like them, let alone love them anymore. But that's not true either. The Bible says here in verse 6 that God allows trouble into the life of a Christian. You ready for this? Because he does love them. Whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. You say, well, I wish God wouldn't love me so much. Well, there's nothing you can do about that. That's not going to change. And we could feel his love in a much deeper way if we would respond correctly to his discipline. If we would humble ourselves in our trials, no matter, again, let me reiterate, no matter who the human source of the trouble may be, or if it may be demonic, it doesn't matter. If we would humble ourselves in our trials and seek God with all of our heart, recognizing his sovereignty and allowing it for some reason, if we would, if we would humble ourselves like never before, seek God like never before, even to the point of laying aside many normal activities if need be, then God would reassure us of his love for us in the midst of us seeking him. at six again. Actually, just the last part. It says he scourges every son whom he receives. Well, that's, that's discipline on steroids. He scourges every son he receives. There are times when God wants to see a quick and dramatic change in the attitude of his child. And that often calls for a severe discipline. Talking about scourging, that means pain, or that may mean extreme fear. That may mean any number of things that really grab our attention and drive us right down on our knees. That sort of severe chastening is what is meant by God scourging his children. But even those things are done in love and with a view toward our spiritual benefit. And I should also quickly add that trouble in a person's life does not mean that they have done something wrong to deserve it. It doesn't necessarily mean 
that they have done something wrong to deserve it. Much of God's discipline is designed to head off a possible fall in the future. For example, Paul's thorn in the flesh. Remember him? There was nobody more on fire for Jesus than Paul. He lived, he sacrificed to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. How many times was that man beaten because of the gospel? How many times was he thrown in jail because of the gospel? Finally, he had his head chopped off. And he had physical problem too. A thorn in the flesh, he called it. He asked God to get rid of it several times. God says, no, no I'm not going to do it. But Paul knew why. To keep him humble because he had seen so many visions of, of heaven. Of, he saw Jesus himself. And he really did. He had all these amazing revelations. He wrote one third of the New Testament by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He was greatly privileged. God gave him a thorn in the flesh, a physical problem that he did not deserve, but in order to avoid future sinfulness because Paul knew that there was a danger of him being puffed up with pride because of all these special things that he had experienced. So God gave him that trouble to keep him from sinning in the future. That may be some of the reasons too that God allows trouble in our life to keep us humble or to humble us or to keep us from becoming filled up with pride or some other sin. And then, of course, there are other times when trials are simply designed to take us to a deeper level of devotion to God so that we know him in a deeper way and are therefore able to be used by him more effectively. In those cases, there's no sin involved either. <clears throat> like Job, he certainly was a righteous man. There was no sin in his life, so to speak. He was living for God. Good example to his children. Just a great man of God. And even God said that. He said to Satan, he says, I have no one like Job. And yet God sent him trouble, sent him all sorts of trouble because as close as his walk with God was, it could have been closer and it ended up being closer after he endured all those terrible trials. And I said all that to say this, when someone is suffering, do not automatically conclude that they are a worst worse sinner than you are or a worse sinner than anyone else. In fact, our response should always be compassion, not condemnation. God has not called you and me to chasten. That's his job. He calls Christians to show compassion to other Christians who are suffering. Verse 7, If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, of which all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. Every Christian, every Christian is suffering in some way. Every Christian wishes they could change something in their life. And whatever form that something takes is in fact the discipline of God their father without exception. Nine, furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh who corrected us and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the father of spirits and live? A child doesn't like it when a parent disciplines them, but that's because they're a child and they don't know what's good for them. It is the parent's job to teach them what is good for them. And then when they, get, when they get older, as God says here in verse 9, they will respect their parents for loving them enough to train them. Not at the time, of course not. But after they grow and mature, they recognize it. We respect 
our earthly parents for their efforts at training. And we should also respect God and appreciate him for, for allowing unpleasant things in, into our life in order to train us and make us more like him. 10. For verily, for they verily, for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit that we might be partakers of his holiness. God chastens, God's, God chastens as seems best to him. Always remember that. Consequently, let him decide what difficulties, what disappointments he wants to allow into your life and how long he wants you to endure them. He disciplines as seems best to him. And by the way, don't, do not waste your time trying to figure out what God is trying to accomplish through your trials. Some Christians are always trying to figure out the whys. They're always trying to figure things out. Let me give you some advice. Number one, God never tells us to figure out the whys. Forget about it. Just respond to trials by drawing closer to God than ever, and he will accomplish whatever it is he wants to accomplish. And if he wants to show you what that is, he'll show you. But your focus and my focus needs to be on drawing closer to God during those times. And then, as a result, he will accomplish what he wants to accomplish. Don't worry about the figuring out the why. Don't waste your energy doing that. God, the Holy Spirit will take care of the why. You just draw closer to Jesus. Then he says in verse 11, Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterwards it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them who are exercised by it. God's chastening is a difficult thing to go through. But there are no shortcuts to holiness. There are no easy paths to holiness. But when we allow pain and trouble to drive us closer to God, he will bring about the holiness that we need in order to experience the joy, peace, and the assurance that he wants us to have. That's why James 1, 2 says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. God is an amazing father. God's love for his children is beyond our ability to fully grasp, but we can get a taste of it through his chastening. That's right, through his chastening. We get a taste, a glimpse of our father's love for us when in the midst of chastening, when in the midst of the pain and the suffering, we turn to him with all of our heart and seek him like never before. Because when we do, he comforts us by his spirit and through his word in a remarkable way. He will comfort us in the midst of our trials. And when he does, he will reassure us that it's all for our benefit. It's all to make us better. And he has done it because he loves us. So when you submit to God's discipline, when you allow it to draw you closer to him, when you allow it to change you, then you will appreciate God's love for you more than you ever thought you possibly could. You will love him more than you ever thought you could. You will want him, you will want to serve him more than ever. You will appreciate him more than ever. You will trust him more than you ever have. And you will only want what he wants in your life because you will know that as your loving Heavenly Father, he knows what is best. And he only wants what is best for you. You get all that when you turn to him in the midst of your suffering. You accept his chastisement. And you draw closer to him than ever. There's a whole lot of benefits there. And no, it's not fun. God says so. It's not fun. That's why it works. There is no easy way. Three steps to godliness. <laughs> Take that book and burn it. Out of time. Continue studying with me at thebibleversebyverse.com. You want to be a part of this ministry? Pray for me. Pray for God's word. Click the donate button at the top of the front page 
at thebibleversebyverse.com and prayerfully give as the Lord may lead. We'll pick it up right here next time.